I'm going to be in Judges, Old Testament this morning, the book of Judges. If you want to turn there, I'm going to talk this morning about something that's ever present in our lives every day. We struggle with it. We give in to it sometimes. And sometimes it can even cost us a lot. We in Judges chapter 16. You know this story of Samson. When I was a kid, you, you learn, you know, Samson and uh, Delilah. Delilah cut his hair off and, and he lost his strength. And, and then he ended up pushing the pillars out of the house and, and the house fell on the people and killed all the people. That's, that's, the, that's the story that you learn in Sunday school. But really, if you look at the whole story of Samson from the time he was born until the time that he died, you can see somebody who was blessed by God with great strength, but then he gave it all up for sin. And this morning, that's the title of my message. It's called Sin, Samson, and You. You know, it's sin is something that we struggle with if we will live past the age of accountability. Uh, and it's not something that you can just turn a, on and off like a light switch. Sin is something that will creep in like a fog around you. And you know, you, if you've ever been out late at night about this time of year, you'll, you'll see that sometimes it, the fog comes in and before you know it, you can't see anything. But you know, that's what sin does. Sin does that and it actually destroys people's lives. You know, somebody who has sin in their life would be somebody who is an adulterer or somebody who's an alcoholic or somebody who may even beat their spouse. Those kinds of people have let sin get a hold of their life. But you know, crucifixion is what sin did to our Lord Savior Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us that He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness in Him. So in other words, what that's saying is that Jesus took all the sin in the world and He put it on Himself and He went to the cross and He died for us. But you know, in, in the beginning, sin has a, a very alluring quality to it. Sin will tell you that, oh, it, it, it's fine over here. You know, come on over, it, it'll be fine. N nothing will happen and, and you can still be who you are. But once it does, you'll eventually end up hurting your family, other individuals around you, possibly even your spouse. But most importantly, who you hurt with that sin is God. Sin doesn't play favorites. As a matter of fact, sin is one of the most unbiased things in this world. Except for... God's perfect love for us. So let's look at what a sin did to a man who was blessed and then he gave in to it. Samson, Judges chapter 16. I'll be starting in verse 19. She made him sleep on her knees and called for a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his hair. Then she began to afflict him and his strength left him. She said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Let's go to God in prayer this morning. Almighty God, we're thankful that we can be here this morning. We're thankful, God, that you took the sin of the world and put it upon your son Jesus and He went to the cross and died for us so that we might have a right to the tree of life. God, Your grace is sufficient for us this morning. And we know that without it we would be lost and dying. God, I pray that if there's someone here this morning who has let sin get a hold of their life, that they will tell sin to loosen that grip and they will come this morning and know You. God, thank You for this 
congregation here at East Point this morning and the stand that they take in this community. We pray that they would always try to seek you first in everything that they do. And Father, may you bless me this morning to proclaim your message. May my words be your words. May I get out of the way and let your word come through. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So let's look at what sin did to Samson. But before we do that, let's see how things came about for Samson to get all his great strength. If you back up a couple of chapters to chapter 13 in Judges, you'll see that Israel had once again did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And that's a pretty common theme in the Old Testament. You'll find that, that they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. The Lord allowed them to be taken over by certain people. You know, the Babylonians, the Philistines, the Persians. He allowed those people to be overtaken. But this particular instance we're talking about here, He allowed them to be taken over by the Philistines for 40 years, is what the book of Judges says in chapter 13. But then, in chapter 13, it says, An angel of the Lord appeared to Manoah's wife and told her that she would have a son. And he also told her that no razor shall come upon his head and he would be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he would deliver Israel from the Philistines. Now if you want to relate that kind of the Old and New Testament, where do we hear the story of an angel appearing to somebody saying that she's going to have a son? In the New Testament, that's the, talking about the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, we know later on that Jesus did deliver us from our sins. But for this instance here in... in Judges, in chapter 13, verse 24 says, Then the woman gave birth to a son and named him Samson. And the child grew up and the Lord blessed him. So we know from the beginning, Samson was blessed from birth. And we go on to chapter 14. Samson has grown up. At the end of chapter 13, it says, The Spirit of the Lord began to stir in Samson. And we go on to chapter 14, Samson's grown up now. And he's old enough to have a wife. And it says he goes down to Timnah and he finds the daughter of one of the Philistines. And he wants to marry her. So Samson goes back home and he tells his mom and dad, I want to marry this Philistine woman. And they try to convince him. They say, well, why don't we... You know, find you somebody from our family or from one of the other tribes to marry other than this Philistine woman because they were thinking of how the Philistines were oppressing them and they were not thinking of what God's will was for Samson because Samson would be the one to deliver them from the Philistines. So, Samson and his mother and father all go to, go to Timnah. The Bible says that Samson went as far as the vineyards. And while his mother and father went to get his wife, in chapter 14, verse 5, it's found that Samson encounters a lion. And it says that the Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson and he tore this lion like you'd tear a goat. He killed the lion with his bare hands. And then after that, we, you'll go on through chapter 14 and you'll see that Samson uh, goes back by the carcass of this lion and there's bees and honey inside of it. And that's important for later on in our story. So, Samson takes his wife and they go back and they, uh, they marry and it says that... Uh, the Bible says that there's 30 of his uh, 30 friends come down with them. And those uh, 30 people are Philistines. And so, Samson tells those 30 men a riddle. And this riddle ends up getting them killed because they can't figure it out. And so, it says in the last part of chapter 14, that the Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson mightily again, and he went down to Ashkelon and he killed 30 of them. 
And then we go on to chapter 15. Chapter 15 says, is where Samson caught 300 foxes. Now, I, I'm going to just tell you right now, I'm not a hunter. A lot of you have seen uh, Aaron's uh, oldest Silas kill that big elk. Uh, he's proud of that, and I would be too. But I can't imagine catching one fox, much less 300 foxes. That would probably take me from now until the day that I died. But Samson catches these 300 foxes, and he ties them by the tail, and he puts a torch in between them, and he allows them to run through their fields. And they burns their crops. Well, this makes them mad. And they go to confront Samson, and Samson kills them. And then later on in chapter 15 is where we find that Samson killed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. That's the end of chapter 15. So, you know, we, we read these events in chapter 14 and 15 of Samson's life, and, and we see that God was truly with Samson. And that he had chosen him to be one of the deliverers of the Israelites to the Philistines. He was one of the judges. The Bible says that Samson judged him there in uh, chapter 15, uh, or 14 rather, for 20 years. But after he kills the men, the thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey, he goes on to Gaza, the beginning of chapter 16 there. And this is where we find that Samson begins to let sin in his life. God was blessed him. He had killed all these people. He had begun to deliver his people from the Israelites. But then Samson, at the beginning of chapter 16, starts to let sin into his life. That sin took Samson on a journey to destruction. And the sin in Samson's life, it came in three stages. And those three stages that came in Samson's life directly relate to the way that sin comes into our lives today. We've got to be careful how we let, not to let sin in our lives because it can destroy us. So the first thing that sin did to Samson. If you want to make these notes, the first thing sin did was sin took Samson further than he wanted to go. At the beginning of Judges chapter 16, verse 1, it says, Now Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot there and went into her. And sin is like tempting Samson to go into this harlot and sin will do that to us. It'll tell you Oh, it's okay. You can do it just this one time. Nobody will know. And it'll be fine. But most people just can't do something like that one time. Even in the Old Testament, Lot pitched his tent towards sin. He pitched his tent towards sin and ended up living in the city of sin, Sodom and Gomorrah. And look what it cost him. You know, Samson, he probably thought a lot of like us, a lot like we do today. He, he thought, you know, just one thing, it won't do any harm. And you know what's sad is some professing Christians even have this philosophy today. They think, well, you know, it's, it's just one beer, how can that hurt anything? Or... It's just a, a social drink out here with the company that I work for. How's that going to hurt anything? Just one drink. But just that one drink can ruin your witness for Jesus Christ if you're a Christian. That one drink can allow sin to be in your life because you know every alcoholic that's ever been started with just one drink. That's how sin creeps in our life is it just one time. That kind of thinking where people said just this one time has left a trail of broken homes and broken bones and lives throughout history of mankind. But the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy 
chapter 2, verse 22, for us to now flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. We're to run from that sin. We're not to get close to it and, and see how close we can get to it before we have to run away. Because if we keep getting closer and closer and closer, it will eventually overtake us and we won't be able to run away. It will take you farther than you want to go. I can promise you that. Samson was enticed by sin. And once he started, he couldn't quit. He left one sinful situation for another. From this harlot in the first part of chapter 16. In verse 4 of chapter 16, if you read there in Judges, it says, After this, it came about that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. We all know that Delilah would be Samson's downfall. But you know, I want, to, I want to talk about this idea of sin taking us farther than we want to go. Why do we think it's okay to tempt ourselves with sin? Because it's not. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18 says, Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. And that's the problem. Immorality creeps in. And it's not just outside this building. Immorality can creep inside these walls and we not know it. We talked in the young adult class back here this morning and it was a good discussion. I enjoyed it. About if you know somebody's doing something wrong, should we go to them and talk to them? Absolutely we should. If somebody is doing something that is sin, that is against the direct will of God, we have to go to them and talk to them. And it's not just the elders of this church. It's everybody. Everybody has that responsibility. Matthew chapter 18 will tell you that. We can't let sin get into our lives because sin will take us further than we ever want to go. And then the second thing that Samson, sin did to Samson, the second thing was sin kept him longer than he wanted to stay. Samson, he, he, he was feeling cocky. He, you know, he started to take advantage of his power. He thought he could get out of any situation at any time. A lot of people think that, don't they? A lot of people think they can get out of any situation they want to at any time. I can, I can stop drinking any time I want to. I can stop having an affair with this woman at work if I want to. I can stop drinking any time I want to. I can stop looking at porn on the internet any time I want to. A lot of those things we don't talk about, but they're sins that can keep us from being close to our Lord Jesus Christ. Now Samson played right into the hands of the devil's thinking whenever he started doing this. Sin deceived him. In, Jude chapter, in the book of Jude verse 4 says, For certain persons have crept in unnoticed. Isn't that the way sin does it? At the beginning I talked about it creeping in like a fog. Certain things go unnoticed in our congregations and before too long it's ripped us apart. Think of all the people think of all the people who are going to be who will have been deceived by sin when Jesus comes back. Who will Sin will have told them, it's okay, keep doing what you're doing. You're going to live forever. I've heard people make the statement that I work with. I'm on the highway to hell and I'm going to be driving the bus. My, what an awful statement to make. If they truly knew what the end of their life was going to be like, living eternity in hell, they would not make that statement and they would fall down on their knees and beg for forgiveness, and ask for the Lord Jesus Christ to be their Savior.
Think about those who, you know, they're not going to turn from their wicked ways. Or maybe even think about the people who say, well, you know, next week I'm going to become a Christian. I, I want to, you know, do this one thing and then next week I'm going to become a Christian. Next week I'll start serving God. Next week I'll start changing my life. Well, what's wrong with this week? Why next week? Paul told the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now, not tomorrow, not next week, not six months from now, now. Because I can promise you, if you don't now, that sin will keep you longer than you want to stay. But you know, even though Delilah plotted against Samson, He thought he'd be able to get out of any situation. And the devil does that, the same thing to us. The devil says, I'll get you out of that situation. You just keep on doing what you're doing. But you know, if, if sin were to have any redeeming value, if sin had any redeeming value at all, and it does not, but if it did, it would be that it is persistent. Sin is very persistent. It's not something that you can just be tempted once and, and turn it down and just it won't tempt you again because it's always going to be there. Sin is always going to tempt you. Sin will make you think that peace and safety exist when actually it's just danger that comes with sin. You know, the Bible tells us to flee from fornication. But neither sin nor Samson, nor sin nor Delilah would give up on Samson. And I'll tell you, and I'll give you the example. As I got to reading this story, Judges chapter 16, verse 16 jumped out at me, and, and I, I kind of felt like I could relate to it a little bit. I go, I'm reading from the New American Standard Version, Judges 16:16. 16, 16. It came about when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him that his soul was annoyed to death. Sin will do that. Sin is very persistent. It'll keep on and it'll keep on and it'll keep on until you're just annoyed to death and you give in to it. And that, my friends, is the point that it will start keeping you longer than you want. The Bible says that she made Samson sleep on her knees and she called for a man to come and shave off the seven locks of his head, just like we read at the beginning. It was that point that sin kept Samson longer than he wanted to stay. And Samson, he didn't know his strength had left him. But you know, there's people out there who are not doing the will of God, who still come to these our church services every Sunday morning, still thinking that God is with them, when actually God has left them because they've given in to the temptation of sin. They come and they, they miss gathering around the Lord's table. They miss meeting with their local congregation. And that's something that we can't do. Because Hebrews 10.25 tells us that we should not forsake meeting together. Because when we meet together, we build each other up. We encourage one another. And that's how we avoid letting sin into our lives. is by building one another up. But you know, there's... Uh, talking about people who have left, you know, the the church, and and they've went to the ways of of sin and to the world. A lot of religions will tell you that there's once saved, always saved. Once you're once you're saved, you're you're okay. You can go you can go do what you want to. But I can tell you right now, that's like saying once sick, always sick. Really, I mean, if you think about it, if you say once saved, always saved, why couldn't you say once sick, always sick? 
That's what sin does to us. It'll make us sick. And I'm asking you this morning, if you're in sin, you need to get out right now. Because the example of Samson's life might become a reality in your life. So we look at the two things that's happened to Samson. It took him further than he wanted to go. It kept him longer than he wanted to stay. And the last thing that sin cost Samson was it cost him more than he wanted to pay. The last part of chapter 16 there. We'll start in verse 21. It says, Then the Philistines seized him and gouged out his eyes, and they brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze chains, and he was a grinder in the prison. Samson went from being this strong man who had the Spirit of the Lord with him to having his eyes gouged out and being a grinder of grain in prison. Now what caused that? Sin is what caused that. But you know, Samson's sin caused spiteful words to be spoken by the Philistines. Verse 23 says in Judges chapter 16, Now the lords of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their god, and to rejoice. For they said, Our God has given Samson, our enemy, into our hands. Spiteful words to be spoken of Samson who worshipped the only true God. Sin is what caused that. Then if you jump down to verse 25, you'll see that the people started making fun of Samson. They wanted a, a spectacle to be made of Samson for all the things that he had done to their people. They wanted to make fun of him. Verse 25 says, It so happened when they were in high spirits that they said, Call for Samson that he may amuse us. So they called for Samson from the prison, and he entertained them, and they made him stand between the pillars. My oh my. To killing a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey. To being made fun of, to being made spectacle in front of 3,000 people. What caused that? Sin is what caused that. He was brought out to be made fun of. He was led through the crowd. And he asked the servant that was leading him through the crowd to make him, to make him stand between two pillars so that he could brace himself. You know, as, as we... Samson was being made fun of. <coughs> I'm sure it was humiliating and it was embarrassing to Samson to know what he had been and what he had become. So he braces himself between the two pillars. And then Samson asked God if he could die with the Philistines. Verses 28 through 30 we'll read. Then Samson called to the Lord and said, O Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me just this time. O God, that I may at once be avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. Samson grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested and braced himself against them and the one with his right hand and the other with his left hand. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bent with all his might so that the house fell on the Lord's and all the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he killed in his life. Samson ends up pushing with all his strength. He asked the Lord if he could die with the Philistines. And the Lord grants him this one last time to deliver his people from the Philistines. And so he pushes with all his might, and the pillars fall, the house falls, and it says he killed more people in that one instance than he did in his whole life. So let's look what sin did to Samson. Sin cost him more than he wanted to pay. It cost him his eyes. It cost him his freedom. It cost him his pride. And it cost him his life. 
But you know, sin cost him a relationship with God. Samson had a good working relationship with God until he gave in to Delilah. What a terrible price to pay for, our, for sin. And as I conclude this morning, I want you to know that the greatest price that mankind can pay for sin is eternity in hell. Romans 6.23 tells us that the wages of sin is death. And my question to anybody who might be here living in sin this morning is this, and I want you to listen to this. If you're living in sin this morning, I want to know this. Is there something, is something that is here today and gone tomorrow? Because James tells us that this, this life is just like what's here today and gone tomorrow. Is something that is here today and gone tomorrow, worth spending an eternity in hell for. Not in my book, it's not. You know, people, I'm, t I'm here to tell you today that all the things that make you feel good here on this earth, they're going to be burned up and gone. They aren't going to last. Eternity is what's forever. And people, as humans, we have the tendency to think about the here and now. You know, I, I hear young people say, you know, I'm living for right now. I'm not living for anything else. I'm just living for right now. Well, I'm here to tell them right now they need to be living for eternity. Because that's what's going to be forever, not this. This, this as the song says, this world is not our home. We're just passing through. And we've looked at what happens when we let sin take over our lives by examining the story of Samson. And James chapter 4 verse 7 tells us, To submit therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. How many double-minded people do you all think walk into our congregations every day or every Sunday, every Wednesday? How many double-minded people live their lives as a Christian on Sunday but not on Monday? Now these people, they need to repent of their sins and they need to turn from their ways and they need to seek God with all their fibers of being because Matthew 6 33 in the Sermon on the Mount Jesus told us seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you I've been doing a Bible study with my wife at home and one of the things we've been studying about is seeking God seeking God in everything that we do as Christians that's what we need to be doing in the decisions that we make at work in the decisions that we make at home, for our families, and our finances. Everything that we do, we need to seek God. Because without Him in it, it won't be successful. But you know, there's people that their sin is telling them what they're doing is okay. And that sin is what's helping them justify it in their mind. And sin will do that. It will make you think... Oh, rationalize things in your mind to where you think what you're doing is okay when it's really not. And it goes against what God's Word says. I have a question for these people. Are, are people who don't obey what the Bible says, are they currently satisfied with their situation? Are they satisfied living in sin? You know, there's a quote from a philosopher, Aurelius Augustinus, that says, The confession of evil works is the first beginning of good works. If you confess your evil, your sin, that's the beginning of what can be something good in your life. And that's one of the things that God laid out in the Bible in the plan of salvation. One of the things we've got to do is confess. But before we confess, we first got to believe that He is 
the Christ, the Son of the living God. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Then after we believe, we've got to repent. Because Luke 13.3 tells us that unless we repent, we too will also likewise perish. Then comes the point of confession. Matthew chapter 10 verses 32 and 33 says that if we'll confess Him before people, He'll confess us before His Father in heaven. But if we don't confess Him before people, He will not confess us before His Father in heaven. Then after you confess, you've got to be immersed in water and grave of baptism. Mark 16, 16 tells us if you repent, and be baptized, you will be saved. And then lastly, after you're immersed, you've got to live faithfully to the end. That's not it. It's not over. It's just beginning. You've got to live a faithful Christian life. James 1.12 and Revelation 2.10 tells us that if we do live faithfully, we will receive a crown of life. And I was never more reminded of our heavenly reward than last night. Uh, my, father, my father-in-law's dad, uh, my father-in-law's an elder at the Cole Run Church of Christ, and my father-in-law's dad had, he's 90 years old. He had lived with his uh, daughter in Lexington, and he had been having some few health problems, but not anything bad for a man 90 years old. And last Friday, he fell in the bathroom and broke his hip. And somebody 90 years old falls and breaks a hip if they're not in good health. I've seen it many times. It's, it's typically not good. So they're faced with a decision. Do they do surgery on a man who's 90 years old? Because they were told if he did surgery, he would never come off a ventilator. But if they didn't do surgery, they was going to have to call hospice care again and let hospice care take care of him until he passed away. But I was never more reminded of how merciful our God is than last night. I was on my way home from Wheelersburg. My wife calls me and says he passed away about 10 minutes till 9 last night. And I got to thinking to myself, God heard the prayers of the people that were praying for the situation because the kids didn't have to make a decision to put him on a vent and then take him off a vent. And they didn't have to watch hospice come in and take care of their father because he passed away peacefully in his sleep. That's how merciful God is. And He can be merciful to you this morning if you'll just come and confess your sin before Him. Because that's what He wants. He wants us to be His children. He wants us to seek Him first. And He wants us to get away from sin. He don't want sin to take us further than we want to go. He don't want sin to keep us longer than we want to stay. And He don't want sin to cost you more than you're willing to pay. People, I'm here to tell you this morning, if you're living in sin, you need to get out right now. That's the only way. And the only way is through Jesus Christ. We'll stand.